My name is Ron Cole. I'm one of the pastors here at Hillside. Welcome to all of you and welcome to those of you who are joining us online. We started last week to talk about the tabernacle, the, uh, the tent that Israel used in the wilderness after God rescued them from Egypt, the tent that they used for worship, the place that represented God's presence in their midst. And because we said that everything in this tabernacle ultimately points to Jesus Christ, we're calling this series Good News in a Tent. For those of us who don't camp, it's the only good news there has ever been in a tent, but it is good news in a tent for the tabernacle. And the passages that we're going to be looking at come from Exodus 25 uh, to 40, those chapters in there, those 16 chapters, all right? Last week, we asked a really important question, kind of the key question for the whole series that we're going to be learning about and answering as we go through the the whole series, and that is, uh, why was the tabernacle important? Why was it necessary? What did the tabernacle do? What was it there for? And what we said is that the tabernacle, the tabernacle was the means by which a holy God could be with his unholy people. The central problem in the Bible is that that we recognize that God is holy, that he is pure, that there is no sin in him. When the Bible talks about God, it talks about a bright, blinding light, about lightning and about fire and about purity and holiness. And there's nothing wrong. There is no sin in God, but we're sinful. There's sin inside of us. And what the Bible says is that when, when God's holiness comes into contact with our sin, it would destroy us if, if, if God just came right to us without any mediation, without anything between us. And so the tabernacle was the means by which that could happen, that a holy God could be with his unholy people. I, I thought of another illustration this past week about it. Not too long ago, dealing with my foot, I, I had an MRI. And if you've ever had an MRI, you know, they put you in the tube there and the magnets go all around it. Um, if you've ever had one, one of the questions you're going to get asked about 10 times and they need to ask it is, do you have anything metal in your body? Do you have a screw, a plate, anything? Did you, have, did you swallow something recently that you haven't passed? Uh, do you have any? And the reason they ask that is because these magnets are powerful and you would get shredded. They would just pull whatever's metal in your body out and you, your body would be shredded. In a sense, that's a picture of, of sin. We have sin inside of us. It's through all different... And, and if God's holiness would come to take care of the sin to draw that out, we would be shredded. All right, just like that. We would, we would, the sin would just destroy us and shred us on its way out. But the tabernacle was a means by which we could be together with God, all right? The tabernacle was that. Specifically, God lived in what was called the tent of meeting. And specifically, in the very back part of that, called the most holy place, it's what we could call God's throne room, okay, on earth. He has a throne room in heaven and God's throne room in, in, on earth. And, and the question we ask is, how do we get to, to be in God's presence? How, how do we get there? What does it take for us to, to deal with the sin that's the problem so that we can come into God's presence? And then how do we live in God's presence? How do we, as, as sinful people, how do we live then in God's presence? Today, I want to look with you at the outer court, all right? And I want to read uh, specifically one section of scripture right now. It's the last thing we're going to look at. We're going to come back to it. But the bronze altar, which I'm going to argue is, in my view, it's the most important part of the outer court, the place of sacrifice, the place where the blood was shed. So I want to read about it from Exodus 27, 1 through 8. This is what we read. Moses is told by God, build an altar of acacia wood, three cubits high. It's about four and a half feet, all right? It is to be square, five cubits long and five cubits wide, seven and a half by seven and a half. It's a big thing, all right? Make a horn at each of the four corners so that the horns and the altar are of one piece and overlay the altar with bronze. Make all of its utensils of bronze, its pots to remove the ashes and its shovels, sprinkling bowls, meat forks, fire pans, everything you use. Make a grating for it, a bronze network, and make a bronze ring at each of the four corners of the network. Put it under the ledge of the altar so that it is halfway up the altar. Make poles of acacia wood for the altar and overlay them with bronze. The poles are to be inserted into the rings so they will be on two sides of the altar when it is carried. Make the altar hollow out of boards. And then this instruction, which again we saw last week, which is so important, it is to be made just as you were shown on the mountain. You don't mess around with God's holiness. You don't cut corners, okay? It has to be done exactly right. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, we're going to talk about the outer court. But before we get to talk about specific things inside the outer court, there are two kind of specific things, the, braze, the altar, the bronze or brazen altar, and then the, the basin, the bronze basin there for washing. I want to real quick, try to get through this quickly, but four notes about the perimeter and the outside of the tabernacle. 
First thing I want to talk about is the orientation or the setup of the tabernacle, the setup and how it would be set up, okay? So I showed this last week, and some of you may have heard of this before, but when the, God, the people of Israel were in the desert and they would set up the tabernacle, three of the tribes would, would camp to the north. There are 12 tribes, three to the north, three to the east, three to the south, and three to the west, all right? The entrance to the tabernacle, it's that little colored area uh, with, uh, with red and blues and so on, scarlet, purple. It, that, that area there, the entrance to the tabernacle, and this is interesting, and, and we'll ask about it, but it always faced to the east. So if we were to set up the tabernacle in the front yard of church here, it would face this way, and the door would be on that side. And the instruction was that that was always to happen. It was always to face to the east. Now, the question we need to ask, and we could ask this about almost every detail, but is this significant? Does this matter? You see, on the one hand, we want to ask that because the, the New Testament Hebrew says that the tabernacle is a, is a shadow of what's in heaven and a shadow of Jesus Christ. It's a type. So we want to say, well, what does this represent? What does this represent? And so we want to ask what's significant about this, but we also want to be a little careful because I'll show you some places where people went, in my view, a little whack on, on coming up with symbolism. They went a little bit overboard on, on saying, oh, this means this and this and this and this and this. But what about this one, that it faced to the east? Is this significant? My answer would be yes, it is. And let me give you the, the biggest reason why I think that is. In the Bible, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but especially in the Old Testament, but in the, in the Bible, going east is most often going away from God. All right, when people go to the east, it's, it's going away to, from God. And when people come from the east, when they come this way, it's coming to God's presence, okay? Think about it and how many stories there are. Let me give you three examples from the first 13 chapters of the Bible. Adam and Eve, Genesis 3. Adam and Eve sin. They're in paradise. They're in this holy place where they can be with God. When they sin, they have to leave paradise, and they're told to go east. And the door to Eden, the door to paradise, is on the east side. That's where the angel is with the flaming sword saying, you can't come back in. And so the, the door, they went to the east, Adam and Eve. And then Cain killed his brother Abel. They had several sons. One of the sons killed the other. Cain killed Abel. And Cain had to leave the community. And again, look at where he goes. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Adam and Eve went east. Cain had to go further east, all right? That's there. And then in chapter 13, Abraham and Lot. Abraham was God's chosen person. Lot was his brother. They have to separate. Abraham says, you choose. And Lot says, I'll take this land to the east. And it was Sodom and Gomorrah, and that ended up getting destroyed, all right? So generally in the Bible, going away from God, going east is, is often going away from God. And when God comes in Ezekiel, God's glory comes from the east. The Messiah is promised to come from the east and come to the west, okay? What's the significance? What does it matter? Actually, Kirk, our, our middle school and our men's ministry guide was talking to me this past week, and Kirk said this. He says, you know what? Here's why I think this is important. God, by setting up the tabernacle in this way, God is saying, come home. The, the very orientation of the tabernacle says, come home. God did not put the, 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 the door to the tabernacle on the opposite side of where sin. he made it as easy as possible. And Kirk, I love the picture. He says, I imagine God there in the tabernacle in the Holy of Holies saying, come on, kids, come back home. Come into my presence. Surrender yourselves. Find new life. When we're going east, we're going away. And God says, come, come home. And so, yeah, I, I, that one I think there's a big enough, strong enough biblical theme for to say it's significant. So that's the orientation, the setup of the tabernacle. All right, the size of the tabernacle, outer court, that's in your books. Uh, if you had them, if you didn't, you can pick one up on the way out. But these little booklets that are some places for notes and so on. Um, but the outer court of the tabernacle, on the one side was 150 feet, on the other side was 75 feet. How big is that? Well, if you had a football field, this would be about 25% of it. Okay, it's about half each way is how big the tabernacle court was, just to give you an idea. And like I said, at some point this fall, we're going to put out some cones to mark the dimensions in the front yard. Um, but you wouldn't be able to see them today because of the picnic. All right, see, that was the second one already. The third thing I want to talk about about the perimeter, okay, real quickly here. But the outer court uh, curtain, all right, around this thing is this curtain, okay? Uh, what do we know about that? Again, we get some pretty specific instructions on this curtain uh, in Exodus 27, 9 through 18. So the verses right after what we read are the ones that would talk about this. It was seven and a half feet tall. 
So taller than well, probably all of us, right? I mean, it, it was something you couldn't easily look over, though it wasn't necessarily had to be secret because the tabernacle's 15 feet tall, the tent of meeting is, and, and so you could see that. It wasn't that nobody can see inside, but it was maybe just privacy, partially that for that, the height of it. So seven and a half feet tall, was made from wooden posts, all right? And there we go, bronze bases and it had silver hooks. Okay, so wooden posts, bronze bases, and then silver hooks. Is that significant? Well, yes and no. There are some people, this is where it kind of drives me nuts, all right? This is, (laughs) I read some guy this week, and he said, well, you gotta understand bronze. Bronze is made from copper and tin. Copper is godly and good, tin is bad, so bronze represents the two natures of Jesus Christ, that he was both God and man. Baloney. That nowhere in the Bible is anything like that talked about. Okay, we can't, we, you know, it's cool. You could get a lot of people going, oh, wow, I never knew that. Well, because it's not said. It's not true. That's why you never knew it. I mean, sometimes we, sometimes it's just there, okay? So I don't think it's anything like that. I could give you, there's all sorts of stuff about bronze. Bronze being uh, maybe there's something about bronze being judgment and the outside of the tabernacle is judgment. Again, the text doesn't say that, so I want to be careful. I don't want to go there. But I do want to recognize this. I think it's significant in this. Outside of the tent of meeting, what we have is everything is either bronze, the bronze altar, the bronze basin, or silver. Everything inside is gold. And so what we get is, I think this is the significance. The closer we get to God's throne room, the more expensive the materials. God is worthy of everything, and and the closer we get to God, the more expensive it is, the more beautiful it is, the more powerful it is. Although I did, again, read somebody who said, well, bronze did better outside than gold, so that's why they used bronze there. See, we gotta be careful in trying to figure out why do we, what, what are we actually concluding? And the tabernacle is so cool of awesome stuff, but it's also dangerous in that it can be something people make crazy statements about. All right, off that hobby horse, all right? Uh, Then the last part is that the the curtain itself was made from finely twisted linen. Um, Is this significant? Again, it probably came from Egypt. Yeah, quality, expensive, same sort of thing. God's house is is worthy of everything. And the the white of it it probably is righteousness, although we're not told it's white. That's the natural color, uh, off-white, actually. So I don't want to make too much of it. But that's the outer court curtain, all right? Like I say, I want to keep going through here. Ultimately, though, I think we have to recognize the purpose of this was was to just say to people, don't get too close to the tabernacle. God is holy. You touch it, you die. Your little doggy runs around and then goes to the tabernacle and touches it, and the dog dies. Your little kid... No, it was offensive protection, okay? That's really the primary purpose of that. It was to mark it off to remind us God is holy and we are not. And so it it gave us that distance, the outer court curtain. And then the last thing I want to touch on here is the entrance, okay? The entrance right there. That's talked about in Exodus 27, verse 16. It's a lot like the other parts of the wall, seven and a half feet tall, bronze bases, silver hooks, finely twisted linen, but this is colored, okay? In verse 16, we read these words, blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and finely twisted linen. That's what it's made of, the work of an embroiderer. So we've got blue, purple, and scarlet yarn into the same finely linen, twisted linen. Are the colors significant? Yeah, but we're not told exactly why. For the most part, pretty consistent throughout scripture, these are royal colors. God is king. And so there's that but let's not push too hard on it, okay? It was attractive, it represented coming into the king's presence, okay? So those things I just kinda wanted to mention just because that it's fascinating and and also to just get you used to thinking about when you read about the tabernacle, think about these things, but don't overthink these things. There were 60 poles. Somebody I read again said, oh, that's five times 12. 12 is the number of the the tribes and five, There were 60. They needed to be every 10 feet or whatever it was. That's why they were where they are. There were 60 because that's how many fit, all right? It's it's, it's not always something beyond that. All right, let's go inside. Let's go, and this is the stuff that really matters for us. This is where I, uh, this is what makes me, just moves my heart because, okay, we're out here, and now we come in. We're invited to come in to take those few steps closer into God's presence. Again, the Holy of Holies is way in the back. But now we come in and there are two major items here in the outer court. 
the bronze altar, and the bronze basin. And I want to start and look first at the bronze basin, even though it's the second one we would come to. It's the bronze basin because the bronze altar, I think, is the ultimate and, and, the, and the most significant part of this. Let's zoom in a little bit on that, all right? The bronze basin, here's how it's described. Make a, be- a bronze basin with its bronze stand for washing. Place it between the tent of meeting and the altar. Put water in it, okay? So it was there between the bronze altar, between the tent of meeting, the bronze basin was there. No dimensions are given on this one, okay? We are not told how big it was. We don't know if it was this size. We don't know if it was bigger. We don't know if it was six feet across. But we know it was a basin that held water. We are told, this is interesting, okay? We are told, and and again, when the Bible is a it's a short book. It's a long book, but it's a short. So words are important. It was made from bronze mirrors. In 38 verse 8, it's made from bronze mirrors, okay? They made the bronze basin and its bronze stands from the mirrors of the women who served at the entrance to the tent of meeting. Interesting. First of all, just to recognize that even though women couldn't touch the tabernacle or the tent of meeting, they could serve in that place. And so that's interesting to me. But what happened was, some of you might remember, if you do good for you, but when Israel left Egypt, the, the people of Egypt gave them gold, gave them bronze mirrors, gave them all this stuff. And now some of the women who had bronze mirrors are bringing them, okay? They would have looked something like this. They didn't have glass mirrors. They had bronze mirrors. You couldn't see very clearly in it, right? But you would polish it as best you could, and you'd look at it, and you'd get the best you could. I'm going to come back to why that's significant in just a couple of moments, all right? This was used only by the priests, all right? The, 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 everything else in here that we see going on, I mean, the brazen altar was used by everybody. Everything else is only used by the priests. Aaron and his sons are to wash their hands and feet with water from it, okay? It's Aaron and his sons, the priests, who are to wash their hands and feet. Only the priests use by Now, if you want to say, but, but that means I'm off the hook, Ron, because you're like the priest and I'm like the nobody, so here we go. I don't have to worry about this one, right? No, 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 no. First, the priests were acting as our representatives, as the people's representatives. And so in them, in them, all of us were being washed at this pl- uh, basin. In them, all of us were cleaning ourselves up. But even more importantly, in the New Testament, if we belong to Jesus Christ, we are all priests. We are all priests. First Peter 2, verse 5 says this, You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You are a priest. I am a priest. Every single one of us is a priest. So every single one of us needs to do what the priests do. And what the priests did is they washed at this basin, and they did it frequently. They did it frequently. Aaron and his sons, back to chapter 30, verse 19 and 20. Aaron and his sons are to wash their hands and feet with water from it whenever they went, enter the tent of meeting. So anytime they went into the tabernacle itself, to that tent of meeting, before they went in, they would stop, and they would wash their hands, and then they would go in. And whenever they approached the altar to minister, they couldn't just go. If somebody had a sacrifice, they couldn't just go there. If they needed to, to, to stoke the fire, they, could, they had to stop. They had to go. They had to wash themselves in the basin, all right? They had to continue to do that. And they had to do that because if they don't, they would die. She'll wash their hands and feet so that they will not die. Again, you don't mess with the holiness of God. And I think one of the big challenges for me, for us, is to try to live with that awareness of how powerful the holiness of God is, but how amazing the grace of God is. Because I don't want to be afraid of God, but I also want to be deeply respectful of God, right? And so these priests would be frequently washing their hands. They'd be going and, and, and they'd be washing as they got done with a sacrifice. Why? What was the purpose of this? Cleansing, all right? This is clearly stated. The reason is to cleanse. And it's at two levels. Again, we have a very practical level here, if you stop and think about it. First of all, physical hygiene. These guys are dealing with, these are butchers, basically. Priests in those days were butchers. The only ones who could butcher an animal in the whole nation. And so the priests would go, and they're butchering animals. They're getting blood on their hands. And then they got to go into, so they wash their hands, and then they go into the tabernacle. They come back out, they wash their hands. And, 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 but they would be, I mean, there would be blood all over, there's dirt all over, there's all this, and they just needed physical cleansing. They just needed physical hygiene. And, and, and the, the meat that was sacrificed and, and killed at the, at the places here, that would be the only meat Israel could eat when, when that happened, okay? That, that meat would be the only meat that they could eat. 
Um, it was the butcher was the, the priest was the butcher, and that continued for a long time. All right, so there was physical hygiene, but there was also, more importantly, spiritual hygiene. All right, there was spiritual hygiene. This was representing not just, oh, I need to get my hands clean, but I need to get my heart clean. And, and that's where I think the idea of it coming from the mirrors is important. Is that what God calls his people to do, what God calls his priests to do, what God calls his people who want to live in his presence to do is to regularly and consistently confess our sins, to regularly and consistently say, God, I have blown it. I have failed. I'm a sinner. First John 1, 8, we read these words. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us, and we need to go look in a mirror. James talks about looking in a mirror, and in some ways, that, that washing, that place, in some ways the waters, of, it's a mirror that reminds us that I'm sinful, I'm dirty. I, I say things I shouldn't say. I do things I shouldn't do. I think things I shouldn't think. And even though I am washed by the blood of Jesus Christ, even though I am completely justified, even though I am completely forgiven, I'm still guilty of sinning again and again. And it's not that God's not going to save me if I don't wash all my hands all the time and if I don't say a prayer of confession for every episode. But if I want to live well in his presence, I have to be somebody who just lives with that humility of recognizing John goes on to say, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just. And he will forgive us our sins and purify us, right? He will wash away all unrighteousness. He will purify us from all of that. And so for me, that's the first major lesson from today. If we're to live in God's presence, we must regularly confess our sins. If we are to be people, if, if, if you know somebody who says, well, I don't really need to confess. I don't do anything wrong. I'd confess if I needed to. I'd ask for forgiveness. But I they're, they're lying, okay? They're lying to themselves. Each and every one of us. That's why we oftentimes, not necessarily every Sunday, but oftentimes in a worship service, we'll have a prayer. Thank God we're sorry. And, and, and every day we wash. Every day we confess. And, and, and if we're going to live in God's presence, that's just part of it. Again, it's not saying, oh God, I hate myself. I'm the worst in the world. It's God, I blew it again. I, didn't, I wasn't the kind of person you created me to be, and I'm sorry. God says, wash and be forgiven. Know this. I will purify you from all unrighteousness. So that's the bronze basin. Then let's end with the bronze altar here, okay? And, and this is, this is the, the most important piece in my view. You can't get close to God without an altar, friends. This is just the way it is, and we have to understand this. Troy, I'm, there we go. It's the first thing you'd see when you walk in, Okay. You would see this four and a half foot by seven and a half foot monster altar, and it's the first thing you'd smell. You'd smell the animals, the sacrifices. You might, there might be other things along here. A lot of times if you see a thing of a tabernacle, it'll have tables like this, but those are for slaughtering animals. They're slaughtering tables. And this is a part where sometimes you kind of go, oh, come on, Ron, do we have to talk about blood? You bet we do. You bet we do. Because it's the only way we can get into God's presence. Four and a half feet tall, seven and a half feet on each side. It's made from acacia wood covered with bronze. We've covered all that. All the implements are covered with bronze. It's got these horns on the corner. That's a whole nother sermon. I'm not going to touch on it right now. But it was a huge cooking service, over 7,000 square inches. They would do a full bowl. But let's get to it. What's the purpose? What's the purpose? This is what we need perhaps more than anything else. It's payment for sin. It's payment for sin. It's what we call atonement, all right? It's washing away of our sins. It's paying for those debts. It's covering those things up. We confess them and we wash, but ultimately the price is blood. The Bible makes it clear. The Bible makes it clear. When someone sins, blood must be shed. There's no other way to pay. It requires blood, and each and every one of us deserves, because of our sin, to die and to shed our blood. By his grace, the blood of a sacrifice was a substitute for the sinner's blood. Le Leviticus 17, verse 11, we read this. For the life of a creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. This is not just old-fashioned. This is reality. Sin is so horrible, it's going to shred something, and if it doesn't shred us, it will shred something else. And that's why that bronze altar was so 
important. The only way we, they could come into God's presence was, was through the blood. And year after year after year, those sacrifices were made again and again and again. Thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of bulls and goats and lambs. On the Day of Atonement, the high and holy day, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the high priest would sacrifice a goat, and then the high priest would be the only one, and only on that day could go into the most holy place, into the holy of holies, and he would sprinkle the blood. And that's the only way God could live with his people. But like we said about the whole tabernacle, we can say about the bronze altar, it didn't work. Because you know what? The sacrifices were never perfect. We needed more. We needed a perfect priest. We needed a perfect sacrifice. And, and when I think about that, I think, you know, I should have drawn a, a bright red line right through that bronze altar and said, no further without perfect blood. And, and the bronze altar could never provide perfect blood. And if you think about knowing that God is over there, life is over there, and I'm stuck here, you understand why at least I and many of us get really emotional about not a bronze altar but a wooden cross. A wooden cross where a perfect priest gave himself as a perfect sacrifice, the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. And he went into the most holy place. And for the final time, he, he washed away our, all of our sins. Hebrews 9, 12 says this, he did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. It was through the cross and only through the cross. It's only that blood that can save us. We don't need a bronze altar, we need a wooden cross, and we don't need a bronze basin. We need the blood of Jesus. We need the blood of Jesus. I'm so glad Eric mentioned that this water represents the blood of Jesus, and that's how we get washed. And when we have the cross and the blood of Jesus, the way is open, and we can be in God's presence. You remember what I said way at the beginning about the tabernacle facing east? What does God say there? He says, come home. And that's what Jesus says. Come home. Come home. Even though you failed, come home. Hey, friends, there is complete forgiveness. Inside of us, there's a guilty voice that says, oh, you keep sinning, you're terrible. You're... God says, no, the blood of Christ is enough. Come home and let me wrap my arms around you. And all we can do is say, Jesus, thank you. All we can do is sing, Jesus, thank you. And let's do that together after we pray. Father, we've sinned. And sometimes we get too focused on our sins. Sometimes we think our sins are bigger than your grace. Remind us that the blood of Jesus is so unbelievably powerful. Remind us that the blood of Jesus has the final word, that the curtain has been torn, that we can come into your presence, that we are clean and righteous. In your sight, we are clothed with the righteousness, the white linen of Christ. Father, we know we still stumble and fall, and so we do confess those things. But we call on the blood of Jesus, the blood of the Lamb, who takes away the sins of the world. And we sing, Jesus, thank you.